it that way. I hope that's okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the NAVAIR booth. Our next, next speaker of today is Vice Admiral Dean Peters, Commander of NAVAIR. He's here to talk about the mission-aligned organization and it's how it has enabled us to deliver warfighting capability to the fleet. We're going to kick off today with a video, then hear from Vice Admiral Peters, and then take your questions, opening up the floor to our live audience as well as our virtual audience on LinkedIn. So without further ado, here we are. Good afternoon. Everybody hear me okay? Hey, great to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, wonderful to see so many uh, friendly faces in the audience. I took a few notes from uh, General Milley's speech uh, earlier. Not going to be able to deliver with the same impact that he does, but a lot of things he said really uh, applies to what we're going to talk about today. Now, I've been coming here since 2008 providing updates on different programs, acquisition milestones, how we're doing, cost and schedule, all those things, all the reporters up front, they always ask a lot of hard questions that I can never answer. But today, we're just gonna talk about NAVAIR, okay? Because that, that, that's the organization, we're one of the Navy's, the Department of the Navy's Systems Commands. So it's important that you all know and have confidence that what we're doing is going to continue to contribute to the mission because that's what this is all about. And you heard Michael talk about the mission aligned organization. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, one of the things that General Milley said was, uh, hey, this is a team of teams. And he was specifically talking about our industry partners. So it's really great to have industry participating. It's great to be out here with industry again. We'll see how long it lasts. But one of the things that absolutely crucial is we cannot communicate enough right we've got to over communicate what the requirements are what our timelines are for procuring things how we're doing technically that's something that's still out there that we need to improve if we're going to be able to take on great power competition it just has to be that way he also talked about our allied countries so it's great to see our allied countries in the audience, all of our partners. We have been able to expand our reach through interoperability, through the foreign military sales cases that we have and through our uh, joint programs. And that's working very well across the board at NAVAIR. In fact, that's where we've seen most of our growth is in our foreign military sales programs. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the organization. We're going to take we're going to talk a little bit about metrics, not much. And we're going to talk a little bit about flight clearances because flight clearances is for whatever reason that's the one thing, that's the one universal thing that people think about when they hear Nav Air. They're like, "Oh yeah, they're the, they're the guys that give us our flight clearance. They're the ones that give us our NATOPS manuals." And then there's a another whole subset of folks 
that understand a little bit more about the, the business and they complain about us, but that's okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right, this is Navair. It's just a uh, kind of a placement view. You got your headquarters in Pax River. I'm gonna point out Lakehurst right here because we're gonna talk a little bit about Lakehurst. That's where we do all of our aircraft launch and recovery equipment. That's where EMOS and AAG is being tested. We do other things there too. We do uh, support equipment and some other uh, technical programs. But uh, Lakehurst has a specialty associated with aircraft launch and recovery equipment. Also, you see up and down the coast, we have our warfare centers. We have uh, the Warfare Center Aircraft Division. We have our Warfare Center, the Weapons Division that's out west. Think about labs, ranges, test squadrons, technical folks that are supporting programs, advancing technologies, right? What we've asked our Warfare Centers to do, not just research for the sake of research, because we have lots of organizations that do that. We're asking our Warfare Centers, let's get technologies into the hands of our, our warfighters. That's what they're all about. Also up and down the coast, you'll see fleet readiness centers. So the third echelon three command is the commander of fleet readiness centers. That's our aviation depots. Some of them are brick and mortar facilities like Jacksonville, Cherry Point, and North Island. Some of them are co-located with the fleet like Lemoore and Oceana, making sure that we get those aircraft moving constantly so that they never actually even go out of the fleet's controls. But that's what it looks like. And there's a tremendous number of government employees, contract support personnel that make NAVAIR work day in and day out. Next slide, please. Okay, we're involved in every aspect of the acquisition process, starting with the formal requirements definition. So you say, well, that's OPNAV's job. That's true. But we have a fairly sizable mission engineering group that does all of the analysis of alternatives for OPNAV so that they can make their choices, they can lay in their budgets, they can put timelines, they can put costs to the different programs that enable naval success. Then there's the derived requirements. That's where you're getting into, take these formal requirements, decompose them, put them into specifications, a statement of work so that we can measure and, and that we can turn the, the formal requirement into an actual product. Then it goes on contract. You all are familiar with the very rigorous and formal government contracting process. Then the development and production. This is the cool stuff, right? You're doing flight tests. You've got hardware, software, and then when it's passed through those wickets, it's into production. This is the part that everyone forgets about, right? I could, if I stood right here, you'd look up there and you'd say, yeah, that, that looks like nav air to me. Hey, what about this piece of it, right? We're trying to bring sustainment back into the acquisition equation. We've been on this journey for three years now at nav air. I mean, We've always known we've had to do it, but we're actually making it happen. I'll talk, I'll talk to you about those fleet readiness centers. We started there, right? We started there with the fleet readiness center. They're the ones that are closest to the fleet. Six years ago, we decided, hey, we're going to put a captain out at um, FRC West. That's where we run all of our Super Hornets through one of the speed lines on the West Coast. So he sent Captain Brett Washburn out there. And then, so we picked him, we sent him out there. He gets out there about three years or so ago and, it, and he calls back and he says, hey, we've got a problem. We just inducted a super hornet. It's Buno, blah, blah, blah. The last time this aircraft was inducted, it, it was inducted here at FRC West six years ago and it hasn't flown since. So there's a problem there. There was a problem with our sustainment ecosystem and it branches out into engineering and it branches out into supply. It branches out into inventory management, all of those things in conjunction. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but that's a Naval Aviation Enterprise effort 
to improve sustainment. Okay, so we, so next slide, please. Okay, so given this the situation that we're in, which I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but I will mention something that uh, General Milley said during his remarks, and that is if we don't figure out how to do this faster, right? If we don't figure out how to accelerate, then we are dooming the next generation. This is, this is about speed. It's about readiness. So, and it's about the balance of the two also. And uh, like I said, I will not be able to articulate it as well as he did, but what he was talking about was adapting, which is great because it feeds right into one of the pillars that's on this slide. But when you're talking about an organization that's your technical and acquisition arm for naval aviation, how do you improve speed and readiness? It starts with moving the resources to where they're actually being, where they need to be used at. So we had an organization that was headquarters centric. Everyone loved the competency aligned organization. It was a functionally aligned organization. OSD loved the functionally aligned organization because it matched their functions. They could call back to the head of cost. They could call back to the head of engineering and they could say, hey, why is this program off? Or give me the dirt on this program so that I know what to ask when they have the review. So from that standpoint, it worked great. It also worked pretty well at developing expertise. The problem was it just wasn't working from a speed standpoint or a readiness standpoint. And if you say we're going to prioritize speed and readiness, then you've got to move resources. One of the things we did, we took the in-service engineering and logistics at NAVAIR and we moved it underneath the commander of fleet readiness centers. So now when you need an engineering disposition on something, you're not just going to ask someone else for that information. You own those resources. You've, and if they're not trained and if they're not resourced properly and if they're not performing, then that's back on that organization. We've also, I'll talk a little bit more about this on the flight clearance side, but we've said the engineers that we put in our program officers, our program offices, they're the ones that are going to decide the technical disposition on things. A little bit more on that to come. We've also put in place a system where we're delegating the, you know, the ability to, to approve at the lowest possible level, but we're not delegating the ability to say no. If you're not happy with something, it's got to go up, right? That's what we have that, that situation. And, the, and the, the, the organization that we were operating under, I think you all can appreciate this. I'm going into a little bit of detail here because if you think there's something here, I want you to take it back to your own organizations, right? So we had this functionally aligned organization with a lot of folks in the functional chain. If someone at the lowest level said no, everyone in that functional chain felt it was their obligation to support the person that said no. What we're trying to do with this delegation piece is a little bit different. It's like, hey, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yes, go forward, keep moving. If you don't like it and you say, hey, that doesn't work right, it's gotta go to, you know, the, that's when the boss comes in to try to figure it out. Not to support your no position, but to try to figure it out. That's working pretty well. Integration, so we're mashing some functions together. Things that make perfect sense when you think about it, but that we actually never did. I'll give you one example here that's very powerful. We had a contracting organization. We mashed together our cost estimation department and our data analytics. We've been able to turn multi-year contracts pretty quickly because if it's something that we've done a few times, then we know what that cost is. Instead of putting out an RFP, getting back all of these basis of estimates, combing through them, 
doing the tech eval portion on our side, going back and forth through negotiations. Someone bids two hours to do this job. We say, no, that should take one hour to do that job. We go back and forth. Eventually, we come to some negotiated settlement, and we're not even sure exactly what it turned out in the end. We just knew we ended up bottom lining it. We know what most of these procurements cost for our fixed price contracts. So we're using our cost estimation team and data analytics, and we are turning big contracts quickly. That's a major, major improvement. The main thing is get these folks, our fleet readiness center COs, our program managers, our test swing COs, the authority that they need to keep moving. That's the speed part of it. Adapting. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two things real quick. One is a technical challenge, and the other is an organizational challenge. Uh, some of you all may have heard of physiological episodes. Okay, so we struggled for years with physiological episodes when it became hypercritical. When we had the issue with T45, my predecessor, Vice Admiral Grosslags, he tried to put together a team to fix physiological episodes and the the frustration that he felt in just trying to pull folks because everyone's like well we don't have that expertise no we can't we can't move from this competency to this competency you know it, everyone was happy with what they had we weren't seeing the big picture we've got to be able to adapt so we have world class experts in certain areas we need not world-class experts, but we need just experts in cybersecurity, network engineering, artificial intelligence, all of those things that you wouldn't think about. And so we're actually we're encouraging, incentivizing, twisting arms, pushing folks into these areas where we need expertise. We're not just saying we're going to keep what we've got and we're going to go try and compete on the open market for cybersecurity engineers. We're training our own folks to do those functions. And it's working. It's working pretty well. The other one I'll mention is an organizational issue. I talked about the functionally aligned construct that we were under. Up at Lakehurst, there is no commanding officer at Lakehurst. So there was many of these functional disciplines that were represented at Lakehurst. We went to the mission aligned organization pretty much just in time. We have put that in place and we said, hey, Kathy Donnelly, you're in charge of Lakehurst. You own this from a warfare center standpoint. Everyone else is supporting you. You're accountable for getting the mission done. So everybody knows what happened in March of last year. Well, the, the Air Force very conservatively pretty much shut down Lakehurst up there. They said, hey, we need your coop plan in an hour. And Kathy Donnelly was able to say, these are the folks that I need on the base. This is a mission critical work that's going, even in disciplines that she was not previously responsible for, but now she was under the mission aligned organization. And we were able to get our workers onto that base to continue the important work that they were doing on EMOS and AAG. She's the one that told us, hey, I would not have been able to do this prior to the mission aligned organization. And we've heard that feedback multiple times, especially from our fleet readiness COs. They say we've got the resources that, that we require in order to be able to move components and aircraft through our depot lines. We're not asking for any more resources. We're not uh, offering any excuses. We're accountable. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the results. It's n everything is not perfect and it's not all set in stone. One of the tenets that we didn't talk about is actually continuing to refine this. But this is our time to contract, right? This is our contract variance. Pretty significant improvement from where we were even in fiscal year 19. You're never gonna get this to zero because of protests. Protests always delay things, and we have an, enough protests that we can't get this to zero, but we can get it into single digits, and we're and this is working pretty well for us. So 
on the industry side, I hope you're seeing this. And a lot of times industry has been a little bit uncomfortable with the speed that we're going. And we realize, yeah, it's, it's different, but we're going to continue it. So get used to it. We're, we're planning to move on this. Quality escapes. Again, the right resources weren't in the right places. Nearly 2,000 quality escapes. These are quality escapes found and verified by the fleet. So just think about the rework and the costs associated with that. This year, to date, we have 20. So we're on a, a, a pretty good glide path to eventually eliminate quality escapes from our repairs. We've got to do better at some of the uh, component work that's still going out. That's one of the help needed that I'll give the industry right now is we've got to improve the quality of the gear that's the new gear that's going out. Okay, FRC financials. It, I don't know if you've ever read uh, the, the Fight to Save Ford. It's the story of Alan Mulally and the turnaround at Ford. One of the things that Alan Mulally said when he got to uh, Ford was all of his leadership team were showing him metrics that they were green, right? He said, we're losing billions of dollars a year. Every one of my direct reports is showing green. Same thing with us. All of our leadership team, all of those functional areas, they're looking good, right? They're, they're green. Our FRC every year is struggling, right? They did not have the resources in the right places. Last year, we were propping up the Navy Working Capital Fund, and we're going to continue to see strong performance if we can, you know, continue to uh, make progress on data rights and things like that and continuing to establish our organic capability. That's kind of the second help needed. I won't go into a lot of detail there, but from an industry standpoint, we've got to do better at exchanging data. We have to have that teardown data if we're going to continue to improve our maintenance plan and optimize our maintenance. Okay, the last metric that I'll give you, I did not put on this slide, because I don't own it completely. That's, it's an NAE-wide metric, and that's the improvement in mission-capable performance over the last three years, 56% to 70%. That's 455 additional aircraft for Navy and Marine Corps pilots and air crew to train with. So the mission line organization was not responsible for that, but I don't think it would have happened without the mission aligned organization. Next slide, please. Okay. Flight clearances, airworthiness. FAA sets it for civil and commercial aircraft. NAVAIR sets it for the Navy and Marine Corps aircraft. The problem is the FAA doesn't have to deal with great power competition, right? So they can take their time. And they often do. If they don't, sometimes they get in trouble. But NAVAIR, we've got to move through this quickly. So we had 650 technical area experts. These are, these are folks that all had a vote, right? They had a vote whether they needed to see something. They had a vote whether they needed data. They had a yes or no vote if it went forward. So we had to just blow that up. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So we, we still have experts. I mean, that's the strength. That's our Title X re responsibility. We cannot ignore that piece of it. But now instead of, hey, I approve or deny this, it's, hey, I've assessed this against the standards that are part of my technical discipline. This is my recommendation. And those folks that are embedded in the program offices and in the fleet readiness centers are the ones that are actually making the decision. It requires you to start thinking, right? If you don't want to, I mean, you want the project to move forward, right? So you're not, instead of just saying, hey, I don't have what I need. I'm going to need this data. I'm saying no until I get it. And you're trying to cover all your bases. Now you're saying, you're looking at where you're at in the program. You're saying, this is where we are technically. 
this is what this is how I think we could approach this differently. So we're going to show a quick video. Two heroes of the Mission Land organization. Two heroes. They're with us here today. Suda Guzman, Kristen Swift. They are folks that have been running the airworthiness office. They're the ones that have crafted this. I brought them here in case there's any questions associated with this. But let's go to the next slide and to the video. Airworthiness is uh, an evaluation of aircraft for safety. Uh, and what we do is we have a process where we get engineering reviews to make sure that the aircraft design, a given configuration, is safe for flight. So we work with our engineers across SNAVAIR, across the NOx, the FRCs, to provide independent assessments of these air vehicles and air systems that allow them to operate safely and effectively while accomplishing their mission. One of the biggest impacts in the Airworthiness Office was uh, the development of a new policy called the Tech Authority Policy. And that was, was something that was driven through MAO. So the Tech Authority Policy really laid the, the framework uh, for allowing us to still get the, the experts that we need involved uh, in each of the reviews. As we developed uh, the mission aligned organization framework and ultimately the implementation of the revision to tech authority policy, there was an emphasis on clear defined roles and responsibilities, but it also talks about tech decision authorities and the differentiation between those two roles and responsibilities. Everybody has a critical role and that's what the tech authority policy does, is it makes sure that, that everybody in the process understands their role, is empowered to do their role, and understands how to collaborate that with other people. So the folks executing technical authority are really foundational to the whole thing. They are providing the technical solutions and alternatives from their particular technical domains that then inform the tech decision authorities, your class desks, your chief engineers, um, who can then take all of those recommendations and make informed decisions of getting those capabilities out to the fleet. The other thing that, that Tech Authority has really opened up was the thought that you can be empowered for something even though you don't sit in a specific office. You can request empowerment and be empowered based on your knowledge, skills, and ability regardless of where you sit. Now that's critical to allow empowerment at the point of execution. The more people we can empower, the more agile we can be as a workforce and we can say, you know, wow, we all of a sudden have a critical issue over in this technical domain, who can we call? And I think it personally gives us more agility to be able to answer emergent questions and to be able to apply our workforce in the areas that are most imperative at a given period of time. Our experts across the services can be used to support any number of products. Whenever there is a, a certification that requires engineering input, it's the collaboration and bringing the team together that helps mitigate the risks by providing more solutions and having more diversity of ideas and thoughts uh, to come up with different risk mitigation options. And I think driving towards that common goal helps us maybe set aside technical differences and look for technical solutions to ultimately get that capability out to the fleet. So I think that focus on mission has been really important. The engineers and, and the technical experts who are, are working on this are contributing to our military, to our services, to our defense of our country. Uh, and these reviews, you know, you may feel like I'm just doing this small little piece of a review, but it contributes to a much larger benefit to our world by doing the reviews that they're doing. by doing the reviews that they're doing. Hey, I just want to take a second and recognize uh, Sue and Kristen. Because uh, a lot of people had complained about the flight clearance process, but they're the ones that actually fixed it and it's, and it's working. That's really what I wanted to share with you all today. Uh, like I said, I've been coming here since 2008 and providing program updates, talking about acquisition. But today, just wanted to talk a little bit about NAVAIR. So I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Great stuff. 
how are you seeing those sorts of skill sets and cultures penetrating into closer to the edge where the FRCs are and those sorts of places so that they can make those decisions in game even faster and more informed? Okay, so here is the example. I remember we were working on uh, V22s. V22 had an issue with some cracks uh, that they were, and the folks down at, at the FRC knew exactly how to fix this particular crack area on a V22. They were gonna do it with a patch, and uh, an adhesive patch on the composite. They had been working on V22 for the last 20 years, and so they understood the aircraft pretty well. Back at the headquarters level, though, folks said, hey, we don't do those type of repairs, right? And it was a strict, it was a flat out no. And that, that repair turned into 200 rivets, you know, for that particular patch. That doesn't happen anymore. Those folks, the folks that are, that are on, I mean, they may get a recommendation. We want to reach back to that level of expertise, but... I, it's a whole new way of approaching the problem set. It, it really, like uh, like the lady said in the video, this is about all hands on deck coming up with the solution instead of just the flat out, I need more data. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, Admiral uh, Frank Wolf at uh, Defense Daily. Um, I just wanted to get any perspective you might have on um, next generation air dominance with um, with the Air Force obviously having its own program and how you see the delineation between the two and collaboration that you're doing and what, what makes the Navy program, uh, how, basically how it's, how it's going right now. Well, we stood up a program office for the next generation air dominance. And I can tell you that although the programs are different, the program is different than the Air Force, there is a very tight integration between the, the Air Force and the Navy on what this platform is going to be. I think the most important thing that's gonna happen with this, with next generation is that we're gonna take all of those technologies that we've developed, those enabling technologies, and instead of picking a platform and then figuring out how to wedge those enabling technologies into it or not be able to wedge those into it, we're gonna start with the enabling technologies and make that part of the criteria for what the aircraft looks like on the other end. I don't know if that helps, but that, in my mind, that is critical. because we have a lot of tremendous work going on on the technology side that, it, you know, it has to be the enabler. Before you even start talking about what does the platform look like, it's gonna be more about how, to, how do we start with these enabling technologies and the operational architecture. Yes. A, a lot of that is their programs also. So it's our technology programs and their technology programs. All right, and that's it for today. We are out of time, but thank you all for joining us. And sir, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, everybody.